So you wanna make some money in the stock market, but you don't wanna wait 40 years for compound interest to make you rich. You'd rather make your money now, when you're still young enough to enjoy it. But there's only one thing standing in your way, the US government. Their law states that every single example in this video is punishable by at least 10 years in prison, but we'll ignore that for now. Let's make some money. So today we'll be exploring the world of securities fraud. In short, this is any practice the SEC feels isn't healthy for the market. So basically any illegal action in the stock market qualifies as securities fraud. But remember, if you do get caught, each time you do one of the things mentioned in this video, it's another charge placed against you. For example, let's say you commit one count of securities fraud. You'll probably serve between 8 to 12 years of your 20-year jail sentence. But if you committed four counts of securities fraud, you'd be locked away for 32 to 48 years. And that's not even considering that your fines will also go up exponentially the more counts you commit. On top of that, most charges overlap. So if you get charged with one, you'll probably get charged with at least a couple more. And with that being said, let's get into it. The year is 2000. The internet is in its infancy. A 15-year-old Jonathan Labed was just getting finished with school. As he gets home, he goes on his family's computer and tries to find some stock to buy. For him to actually buy a stock, it needs to follow three qualifications. It needs to be publicly traded, trading volume needs to be extremely low, and the company should be considered a micro-cap company, a stock with a market cap worth less than $300 million. Eventually, he finds a company that meets all three of these qualifications, and he buys $8,000 worth of their stock. But after he buys the shares, the real work begins. He sends out thousands of spam emails. He types hundreds of messages into Yahoo Finance message boards, all talking about his newly purchased stock. He starts spreading completely insane projections for the company, and he continues to talk about his short-term positivity for the stock, saying things like this stock will be the next one to gain a thousand percent, and this was, and I quote, the most undervalued stock ever. Surprisingly, some people actually take his advice, and they buy some stock on Lebed's advice, leading to an ever-increasing snowball of buyers, sending the share price to the moon overnight, even though nothing has actually changed with the company itself. While all of this buying pressure is happening, Jonathan starts fanning the flame. He continues posting on these message boards, boasting about his 50 to 100% daily returns, telling everyone they should get in on this opportunity before it's too late, all while planning to sell his shares at market open tomorrow. So Jonathan goes to sleep, wakes up, and goes to school. The stock opens up big. He finally sells his position while he's at school for a profit of between $11,000 and $74,000 depending on the trade. And keep in mind, this is only for a couple of days of work. He then rinses and repeats his behavior on 11 separate occasions. Unfortunately for Lebed, the SEC eventually catches this blatant fraud and they begin to assess the damage. He was charged with 11 counts of internet fraud and was given a fine of $285,000, including all of his trading profits plus interest. All in all, a 15-year-old Jonathan Lebed was able to make $272,000 in profit in only about six months of trading, making every member of Wall Street Bets very angry. Speaking of Wall Street Bets, it's almost certainly filled with people and companies all acting exactly like Lebed, looking to get people on the subreddit to buy a certain stock. My suspicion is that these Wall Street guys are using automated bots to write messages or blow up some user posts they agree with so they can do a similar thing Lebed just did. And it's not just Wall Street Bets that all these bots are on. R slash stock market, R slash investing and r slash cryptocurrency are almost certainly filled with these automated machines. So while internet fraud may seem like a good idea at first, it probably isn't the best way to make money in the stock market. <laughs> So racketeering may take a little bit more effort to pull off successfully, but the reward can be massive if you manage to do so. Let's take it back to the year of 1986. High school student Barry Minkow had a fantastic idea to make some money, so he starts a carpet cleaning company called Z-Best. It would be the General Motors of carpet cleaning, or so he said. In reality, the business was built on nothing, filled with debt and struggling to pay its bills. He was even forced to pawn his grandmother's jewelry to meet payroll, but this adversity didn't stop a determined individual like Minkow, no. He decides to falsify over 20,000 documents in order to gain credibility to insurance companies, allowing him to fake millions of dollars in revenue for his company, which gives him easy access to any loan he needs to keep his fraudulent company running. Eventually, there are so many investors who want a piece of his company that he decides to take the company public, allowing him to raise another $15 million. After some time, the share price climbs drastically, valuing the company at a staggering $280 million, making Minkow a very rich man, seeing as he owned 40% of the company. But 
eventually, cracks start to form in the company's early years. People discover some of the shadier things the company needed to do to stay alive, such as not paying employees and overcharging clients, leading to Ming Kao being charged with credit card fraud, which started a company-wide investigation that led to the company's fraudulent records being exposed, leading to a Chapter 11 bankruptcy filing that happened shortly after, and the legal system throwing the book at Ming Kao. All in all, more than a thousand employees lost their jobs due to the scandal. The public was defrauded for more than $200 million, and the legal charges placed on the board of Z Best were insane. 54 counts of racketeering, securities fraud, money laundering, embezzlement, mail fraud, tax evasion, and bank fraud, which led to a prison sentence of 25 years, 5 years of probation, and a $26 million fine. As you can see, it takes a lot of effort to start a company, even if it's completely fraudulent. So this probably isn't the best way to make your riches in the stock market either. <laughs>basically everybody's heard of a Ponzi scheme or two. Whether it be Charles Ponzi, Enron, or Bernie Madoff, it's one of the most common financial scams out there. But there are some crazy ones that you probably haven't heard of. In August of 2012, Trendon Shavers was browsing around internet forums with one mission in mind, to promote his new company. His new business, called BTCST, was a non-existing company promising oversized investment returns in the arbitrage space. For example, Let's say you can buy a stock for $5, and you can sell it to somebody else for $6, and then you can repeat that same process over and over again. That'd be pretty great, right? Yeah, but it's rarely, if ever, the case. And most people who claim they can do this are probably running a Ponzi scheme. And Chavers was no different. So he kept promoting his new company anywhere he could. And eventually, some early investors actually got their promised returns, building needed credibility to this operation. So the good word of these initial investors got more people to put in money, leading to a great opportunity for Chavers to take what he can and run. In total, Chavers was able to take $800,000 out of his scheme before ghosting all of his investors and going on the run, leaving some of them penniless. However, Chavers was smart about his promotion. He kept it completely anonymous. Nobody actually knew who he was. He would always go under an alias. Because of this attention to detail, Chavers was able to stay on the run for over two years before eventually being apprehended. However, something else happened when he was on the run. See, his $800,000 wasn't in US dollars. It was in Bitcoin. He was running a Bitcoin arbitrage scam. And at one point, his scheme was responsible for about 7% of all Bitcoin on the market. And by this point in 2015, the price had gone up 2,200% from when he initially took it out. So it went from being worth $800,000 to now being worth over $19 million, making it one of the biggest crypto heists on record. And the same Bitcoin would be worth $32 billion today. After everything was said and done, Chavers was sentenced to 18 months in prison for running the first ever crypto Ponzi scheme. But it would be far from the last Chavez was also fined 1.2 million dollars the exact same amount lost by his investors however this 1.2 million dollars was all in bitcoin as well so the investors in this scheme lost much more in reality although ponzi schemes are known for making millions and even billions of dollars they typically take between 10 to 20 years to pick up any steam ruining your plan to get rich while you're still young but there is a way to make money in the stock market very quickly the real question is this, is all this legal? Absolutely not. But we were making more money than we knew what to do with. The classic Wall Street scam, the inspiration for this video even. A tried and true way to steal millions of dollars from the general public. Basically, you buy low, drive the price up, and sell when the price is substantially higher than it was originally. Seems simple enough. So let's follow in the footsteps of the most famous Wall Street con man in history, Jordan Belfort, aka the Wolf of Wall Street. So Jordan was running a stock brokerage called Stratton Oakmont. They would use manipulative sales techniques to get rich investors to buy risky penny stocks, usually through a process known as the straight line sale pitch. So these traders had all these investors in the palm of their hands. They'd be willing to buy just about anything if their broker told them to buy. Then one day, Stratton Oakmont gets the deal of a lifetime. They were able to take the biggest clothing company at the time public, Steve Madden, which means massive profits for the brokerage. But the crazy thing is, Jordan Belfort and other Stratton insiders owned about 80% of Steve Madden, meaning they could run one of the biggest pump and dump schemes ever. They had full control of both the supply of the stock and full control of the demand for it. So, on the day of their IPO, they set the share price at $4 per share. And throughout the course of the day, through massive pushes by everybody who worked at Stratton Oakmont, they got the share price as high as $16 per share. It was the hottest stock on Wall Street, and Jordan Belfort was selling the entire way up, eventually making $22 million in three hours. Of course, this is completely illegal. And of course, Jordan gets caught, and he pleads guilty for securities fraud and running a pump and dump scheme. Eventually, he was sentenced to
sentenced to four years in prison and was fined another $100 million for this action among others. And while this made Jordan Belfort a lot of money, you probably don't have a room of stockbrokers at your disposal or millions of dollars to invest. I mean, at this point, it almost seems like the game is rigged against you. So why don't we break it? Market manipulation is exactly what it sounds like, manipulating the market, but there are multiple kinds of market manipulation. And here's an example of one of them. It's May of 2010, and the US stock market is having one of the most volatile days on record, which piqued the interest of a 32-year-old day trader named Navinder Saro, who up until this point has made a pretty penny day trading the stock market, with trading profits in excess of $40 million. But there was one thing that Saro couldn't stand, automated stock trading bots. These machines would make hundreds of thousands of trades per day, often resulting in huge volumes in wildly volatile markets. Not to mention the risk of a bug in these machines, which could lead to a massive flash crash. So Soro decided to test his theory about a potential bug in these machines. However, it would take a perfect storm of events to accumulate into a flash crash. Highly volatile markets, lots of money flowing through trading bots, and some pretty crazy luck. But the perfect storm arose on May 6, 2010. So Soro decides to manipulate the market. Immediately, he puts in a massive amount of sell orders, which results in some trading bots selling their shares, which leads other trading bots to sell their shares too, leading even more bots to sell their shares. Shares. This continues over and over again with no end in sight. And before you know it, the Dow Jones drops over 9% in 36 minutes, leading to more than $1 trillion being wiped off of the market, which made everyone on Wall Street fear that something truly awful just happened. Lucky for them, however, nothing out of the ordinary really happened. So people decided to investigate, and they discovered Soro canceled the massive amount of sell orders that started this entire chain of events. But this doesn't stop the trading bots from selling even more of their shares. This event is known today as the 20 10 flash crash, and nobody's even sure if Soro even started it. But the media needed somebody to blame. Because of this, the courts threw the book at Mr. Soro. His original charges would have put him in jail for 360 years, but the jury felt some sympathy for him for a combination of reasons, including his prison time in the UK, his autism, and the fact that it can't even be proven that he started the crash. And because of this, Soro received a sentence of one year of home detention in January of 2020. But if you wanted to do a similar thing nowadays, this would be substantially more difficult. In the past 10 years, there has been a vast improvement in trading machine technology, making a crazy flash crash like this one nearly impossible to initiate by yourself. It just seems like everybody knows more information than you. But in most cases, money talks. So why don't you just buy some of that information? Alright, so insider trading is one of the most common white collar crimes. Some estimates even show that up to 10% of all trades in the stock market are breaking insider trading laws. So as you can imagine, there's a backlog of insider trading scandals. But this one is one of the crazier ones. Down 1.7% here, a loss of 37 points or so. Apple shares are just getting hammered this morning. We're down by between 3 and 4.5% 4 and generally across these markets. Let's talk about the speed with which we are watching this market deteriorate. The stock market is now down 21%. What in the world is happening on Wall Street? It's 2008 and the financial crisis was in full effect, leading to trouble for most financial risk takers. One of those people was a professional sports gambler named Billy Walters, who apparently needed another way to make money. So Walters decided to purchase insider information on a multitude of companies and trade based on this information. On one occasion, he paid for insider information about a food company and used this information to make nearly $1 million in only about a week. On another, he purchased almost $30 million of Darden restaurants based on an illegal stock tip. The share price quickly rose 7% within a month, leaving Walters with a $2.1 million profit. All in all, he made $32 million based on insider information between 2008 and 2014, while also avoiding another $11 million in losses. But the truly interesting thing about this case is his passing of insider information to professional golfer Phil Mickelson and billionaire Carl Icahn. The prosecution claims Mickelson made nearly $1 million after a stock tip given by Billy Walters where Mickelson bought shares of a company about a week before they released their earnings reports. The stock rose nearly 40% after the release, giving Mickelson a $931,000 profit, which he then gave back to Walters to repay a debt. Neither Mickelson nor Icon were charged with insider trading, but Billy Walters was charged with 10 counts of it, leading to a five-year prison sentence and a $10 million fine. So in short, Billy Walters made $22 million in profit after all fines and trading fees. He also avoided another $11 million in stock losses 
all while only serving three out of his five year prison sentence, which if you do the math, is a yearly salary of $2.4 million for each of the nine years he was either trading or in jail, which seems like a pretty sweet gig. But there is one downside. Finding insider information is a lot harder than it seems, especially if you don't come from the wealthiest background. So the idea of entrepreneurship quickly creeps back into your head, but you quickly realize that founding a billion dollar business is a lot harder than it looks. So why not just fake it till you make it? Imagine starting a company that everybody thinks is going to change the world. A company that could diagnose deadly diseases from the comfort of your own home, or through a store like Walgreens or CVS. Then imagine that you built that company on a technology that doesn't even exist. This is the story of Theranos, and its story is one for the history books. Elizabeth Holmes comes up with this idea for Theranos after seeing the SARS outbreak in Asia firsthand. So she drops out of Stanford to pursue this idea. Luckily for Holmes, she knows a couple of angel investors and got nearly $6 million in funding for her new company. Unfortunately, the technology she was trying to develop wasn't working, even with millions of her investors' dollars. So what does she do? She lies. She claims the company has a viable product available for purchase, and there are customers lined to the streets for this revolutionary machine. Walgreens even gave Theranos a $140 million contract for the pre-order of their machines. But the technology hasn't improved. Even after five years of testing and tens of millions of dollars invested, there was just no way Theranos could deliver on their promises. But by then, the company had risen to a valuation of $9 billion, and Elizabeth Holmes became the youngest female billionaire in history. She was even drawing comparisons to her idol, Steve Jobs, giving her and her company strong positive attention from the media, which drove up sales figures even more. However, the Wall Street Journal began to grow suspicious of all the success Theranos had been claiming, so they ran an investigation into Theranos and they dug up the entire thing. The Wall Street Journal publishes a scathing article about Theranos shortly after. They showed the Theranos machines weren't capable of running even the simplest test. This is absolutely disastrous for Theranos. All of this bad attention eventually leads to a government investigation, which ended in the collapse of the company, $100 million lawsuits, and serious legal charges being placed on Elizabeth Holmes. She's currently facing a maximum of 20 years in prison and a $2.75 million fine. And that's basically it. Those are seven different ways to make money in the stock market. Legality and morality aside, of course. But as I'm sure you can see, these illegal practices aren't worth the risk or the effort required. Not to mention most of the ways require startup capital, a team of salespeople, and no moral compass whatsoever to actually be successful enough to be noteworthy. And all of that effort would probably be best spent making money normally. But I just wanted to say thanks for watching to the end. It really helps my channel out a lot. And if you enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate it if you'd subscribe. It's free and you can always unsubscribe later. So yeah, Thank you for watching to the end, subscribe if you haven't, and I'll see you guys next time I upload.